So Nick Dandiger is one of the world's foremost photojournalists and his work appears in newspapers, magazines, museums and galleries all over the world and it's all because of a fictional Belgian comic strip character. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Nick Danziger. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you heard a little bit about how I wanted to get started. Um, in fact, my parents, the first thing, as I think all of us when we were kids, you're asked by friends of the family, what do you want to be when you grow up? And in fact, I don't know, some of you are probably too young to remember, the tube train guard driver at the back used to close and open the doors. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to push the buttons, because going to school, they allowed me to do that. And my father was a little horrified. He said, why do you want to be a guard on the tube? And uh, I said, well, I want to travel, to which he answered, you'll travel from one end of the tunnel to the other. Um, as David mentioned, my, my, I think, curiosity about the world and cultures was elicited by Tintin, the Belgian cartoon character. At age 13, I announced to my parents that I was going to Paris for the week. They didn't believe me. We lived in Switzerland at that point. And in fact, with no uh, visas, passport, I didn't need a visa, but I needed a passport and a train ticket. Uh, I had none of that, and I did manage to get to Paris for the week. And in a sense, that really changed my life. I wanted to be an artist. I sketched, and people gave me a bit of money, but I lived rough. And I went on traveling. Age 17, I went to uh, South America on my own. And um, I did become an artist, a painter. And in uh, 1982, I applied for Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship to uh, dug a uh, fellow tree and build my own dugout canoe and take it through the jungles of Central America. I always had a camera with me. The, that journey didn't actually happen because of the Civil War and the Churchill Trust said, well, you've got a, a year to think up another project. I wanted to travel to Soviet Central Asia. And uh, some of you will remember that a, a Soviet MiG fighter downed a Korean airliner. So that went out the window. And then I said, well, look, I want to go to Burma. And half the uh, cabinet was blown up by a suicide bomber. So the Churchill Trust were getting a little bit suspicious. <laughs> but two years later, in 1984, I announced to them that I was traveling overland along the Silk Routes to um, China. And uh, they were very happy about that. But just prior to leaving, the office, I had to explain to them that I'd spent all the fellowship money. So very nervously, they gave me 800 pounds, which was in fact enough for the first 16 months of the journey. So I set off uh, through Eastern Turkey, all overland. I arrived in Iran, very afraid at the time. I had no visas, as I mentioned. And uh, it was at the time the height of the Ayatollah Khomeini's revolution. And what you see uh, behind me is an image uh, taken in a side street and I was under the impression that this was some exhortation to the Islamic Revolution. In fact, those of you who can read Farsi, it reads, gas and water boiler repairs to the left. <laughs> From here, I traveled on into Afghanistan. I was smuggled in by what were then known as the Mujahideen, the Holy Warriors, and we were ambushed, and I lost all of my equipment. It was very upsetting because I had no way of documenting what I was seeing. And uh, I went off, I walked for six weeks through the country, and I was maybe some, I can't tell exactly, but at least 200 kilometers from where the ambush took place. And at the end of the day, I was sitting in a, a, a village mosque, and two young men came with their patches, a sort of blanket tied over their shoulders, and they asked the mullah, have you seen a foreigner come through the village? And he questioned them a bit further, and then pointed to me. And they came over, they undid their patches, and inside, and this is the village where my bags were reunited, with me. And everything was there, my cameras, my journal that I had kept, there they were. And I was really quite astonished that in a country going through a war and, and such devastation and poverty that they would uh, go to the efforts to try and find me. <coughs> what was extraordinary was some people uh, were allowed to know who I was. I was just disguised as a, an itinerant Muslim, so I had a big beard and a turban, you'll see a bit later on. And uh, in Afghanistan, you can't just walk into a village. It would be like walking into your home. The, the white beards would come down, and they're called the Rish Safid. That's the word in, in Dari. And uh, they would want to know your business. Where I was allowed to be known that I was from England, what was extraordinary, everyone tunes into the BBC World Service, even today. And their programs are broadcast in Persian. But the preliminary announcement is in English. So they would come forward, and they would put their hands on their heart, and they would greet me with, and our next program will be in Persian. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So I traveled on uh, into um, China over a border that had been closed since uh, 1949. And uh, I was caught four days into China. I was put under house arrest. I wasn't allowed to leave the guest house I was staying in. And what was incredible was that because of the way I was dressed and I would say assalamu alaikum and speak a, a little bit of Dari, they, they thought I was one of them, the Uyghurs. This is the, the Western population of China, a Muslim population, and I would be very diplomatic. I would explain, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not overseas Chinese. I'm not a Uyghur. And in one of the villages, yet again, everyone had assembled, predominantly the men, and a young man came forward after I'd explained for the umpteenth time that I was not an overseas Chinese Uyghur. He said to me, well, how many Uyghurs are living in Englishstan? And I had to apologize. I said, there are no Uyghurs living in England. And he turned around to the assembled crowd and he said, he's the only Uyghur living in England. <laughs> Well, the Chinese, it's a long story, and the Chinese wanted to put me, uh, arrest me and put me in, in prison, or I had to pay a fine. So I said, I'll go to prison, but they never really wanted to, to jail me. So I uh, ended up going to Tibet, which was closed. This is 1984. And uh, again, language was always a, a bit difficult. This is a picture of a, a tso, which is a cross between a yak and a cow. And, and uh, one of the men in the, in the village sort of confided that yak backbone properly crushed and mixed with gold dust is used as a contraceptive. I don't know why you're laughing, but as I was leaving the village, he actually came up to me to say, it doesn't always work. <laughs> well, I mentioned how I was dressed on that initial journey. I, the Churchill Trust were very pleased when I did finally reach Beijing after 16 months. And this was uh, a picture taken by the Chinese press. I, I had a one-month visa at this point, but this was on my eighth month in China. But they wanted a press call so that this could go out through uh, Xinhua, the, uh, the news agency. And the caption that was used under this in the Chinese newspapers and magazines was the Imam of Beijing with Nick Danziger. And in parentheses underneath, Nick Danziger is on the right. <laughs> I was a painter then, and I, I wanted to get back. My first book was illustrated with my drawings as well as the text. And uh, I was finding it very difficult. I had an acne studio in the East End of London. I was living in Poplar. I ended up working, actually, as a cashier in Paul Smith's in New York when he opened his first store. And um, the first book came out, unknown to me, was very successful. When the publishers found me, they got me back to the UK. And it was only when Saddam Hussein was... Uh, gassing his own people, and various magazines had heard about that journey through my book, that they commissioned me to go into that area, and I, I accepted. I wanted to, to photograph some of the people and some of the areas that I'd, I'd already visited uh, six years before. And these images, set of images taken from uh, the Kurdish area of Turkey inside a refugee camp, and whilst I was there, the soldiers opened fire on the unarmed refugees, civilians, and the dead and injured were being brought back into the center of the camp. And then what I witnessed was very much what I had witnessed on my first trip to Afghanistan. What we don't read about is the trauma that individuals suffer, the psychological damage of seeing close uh, ones either being uh, injured or indeed being killed. It's really often the untold story of many of these conflicts. And on that first journey to Afghanistan in 1984, a month and a half in Afghanistan, I didn't see a single woman. Actually, that's not quite correct. I saw one woman, a grandmother, and everyone teased her because an outsider had seen her. I could have been an Afghan from a different village. So I wanted to go back to Afghanistan and see how people lived in the cities. And what I discovered was that the women uh, had no... Uh, desire to see. They didn't want the government that was in power there, supported by the Soviet Union, but they absolutely didn't want to see the Mujahideen come to, to, to power because they knew what would happen to their lives. And this is a rather abstract image lying down on the tarmac of Kabul airport. And what you see are flares that are being jettisoned from the plane so that the heat-seeking missiles uh, don't actually hit the engines. That continues today in many parts of the world where there are conflicts, and the flares don't always burn up. And when they come to the ground, kids pick them up because they think it's a toy. So the next picture is a rather difficult one. It's the only difficult one I'm showing here today. But this is the result of some of these attacks. Children get burnt. And in that particular attack, 26 children were burnt, and only two survived their injuries. And again, what I discover in so many of these areas of the world is it's the children 
that bear the brunt not only of the lack of education, in this case, uh, children being indoctrinated into the regime's ideology. This was taken in 1989 on International Women's Day. But often, the children take over the running of the economy. The men are either press-ganged into the various armed factions or uh, become refugees. They fled uh, their countries. Here, just a scene of ordinary life. It's a bakery that is being overrun by women desperate to get hold of a loaf of bread. And the ironies of these conflicts, this is the Stinger missile. So the missiles that would, in theory, uh, be used to down enemy planes, these were given by the CIA to the Mujahideen. And in fact, the Mujahideen, rather than use them uh, to bring down their enemy, decided that they would sell them on to their enemy, who in turn tried to sell them back to the CIA. <laughs> so I was actually present at one of those meetings. And here you have the kind of anarchy that still reigns many parts of Afghanistan today. This was actually a taxi that uses a bus route uh, inside Kabul. Citizens of Kabul in the mid-90s couldn't cross their own city because of the division between the various rival factions. They pulled the passengers out of the taxi and got in, commandeered the taxi. Obviously, at this point, I'd become a photojournalist and decided that I'd wanted to stay with them and go to the armed front. Well, something completely different. Intimate access again. And as you can see here, Tony Blair, in the lead up to the Gulf War with the Deputy Prime Minister, Alistair Campbell. Sorry, I mean the Director of Communications, Alistair Campbell. <laughs> what was interesting about this series of pictures, he was almost always present. So this is the den uh, in 10 Downing Street, taking a phone call from Yasser Arafat. It was a an assignment from the Times magazine who wanted to do a feature on his 50th birthday. But it was taken in March uh, of 2003 in the lead up to the war. At the end of the first day, uh, I asked if I could come back the following day. And they said, didn't you get all the pictures you needed? And I said, well, what is he going to be doing tomorrow? Well, he's going to be taking a call from the president of Chile. He's going to launch the Middle East peace plan. And I said, well, do you think I could come back? And they said, all right, your name will be on the door at 8.30. And for the next 30 days, I was able to have the most extraordinary access. Here you can see at the European uh, Council, uh, on a wide-angle lens, uh, using film. I was even able to reload. But um, right next to uh, President Chirac and the then Prime Minister Blair, as they had the most intimate discussion. Alistair Campbell had been waved away. The interpreters had been waved uh, away. And uh, they were having it out. Uh, in English. Again, an intimate picture during the course of the war. And here on a flight to meet uh, President Bush in the United States. There was a lot of, as you remember, of going backwards and forwards between the two countries of the two uh, then world leaders. And here a picture at Camp David. Uh, the first, I was the first independent photographer that had been given this access to Camp David. Um, in this particular case, I think I like referring to this picture as my uh, reservoir dog's picture. <laughs> um, so that assignment finished, but I continued to work for many of the major magazines, Stern, Parry, Match Time, Newsweek, which is now exclusively on iPad. There's no print edition. Um, and I knew that uh, Tony Blair was uh, going on secret missions into Baghdad, so constantly I was asking for access. And one day I was told that he would be on a Middle East tour and that it might be very interesting to me. So in fact, I, I left on assignment for Newsweek. And very early one morning in a hotel in Cairo, at three in the morning I was woken up and the next thing I knew was that I was on a special forces helicopter into the center of Baghdad with the then prime minister. Uh, Ian is the Scotland Yard close protection officer on the left, but he went with, there were no aides, translators, or anyone on that Special Forces helicopter. Rather curious for you, if you can't read uh, the back of the helmet of the Special Forces gunner, you'd be dead because it reads in English, anyone who approaches within 100 meters will be shot. <laughs> and again, a rather unusual picture. Uh, the audience with the Queen, I was uh, given permission by Buckingham Palace, so I really wanted to complete this portfolio. It was just before he handed in his resignation. I was explained, it was explained to me that I would go and meet Her Majesty the Queen prior to the Prime Minister going in. She might want to have a little chat with me beforehand about what I was uh, attempting to do. I was told that uh, they would greet formally like this, and then um, sit, they would sit down, and at that point I would have to leave. And I was told, you know, you, you say hello, mom, and you bow once. 
and I arrived uh, right at the door there. The queen greeted me, and I said, hello, mom. And I was so nervous that I found myself bouncing up and down. <laughs> she calmed my nerves, and then I moved in. And it, it, what was curious was that uh, the prime minister was very surprised to see me, and there I was taking my picture, and he said, um, I think that'll be all, Nick. And I was actually in the rather unusual position of saying to the prime minister, actually, prime minister, I've been given permission to stay a little bit longer. <laughs> there are other world leaders, or spiritual leaders, in this case, the Dalai Lama. I do try and keep a distance, because I believe I'm there to, to carry out a job, not to be their friend. But nonetheless, as you can see in the following picture, there we are. <laughs> Here's a, a, a rather unusual picture. I was asked to do this precisely because I don't usually work with lights or in a studio environment and the Spanish royal family. Uh, that was the condition for taking these pictures. Uh, quite, this is, this is a, a, a rather reworked picture for Vanity Fair as it would be on the cover. But my preference is for the real picture before the press are given admission. Slightly dysfunctional. <laughs> Also, you might be curious as to what this was. I was very surprised, actually, to also, uh, not the political coverage, I didn't take any sports pictures prior to this. You think, sports, what's this about? I was actually asked whether I would be interested in a behind-the-scenes access, never granted before, of the world's most successful professional sports team. I think some of you will have guessed now. It's the All Blacks, and that's the greeting party at Wellington Airport, the arrivals hall. But you will see a series of pictures here, one of the players jumping. That's equivalent to the weight of one of you going up and down for two minutes. And in fact, one of the players, when he played badly, Graham Henry, the manager, said to him to, harden, to get him to harden up, drink concrete. <laughs> I was told there were three areas that I wouldn't have access to. The first being the team coach, because that was considered sacred territory. The hacker, because they don't control the field and uh, the changing rooms prior and during the games, maybe afterwards. But as you can see from that previous picture, that was on the coach. The game, obviously, was one thing. The haka, well, I began by taking what is a traditional uh, wall cry before all games and hear the spectators, but I did eventually get access not only to the hotel room where they were practicing the haka, but to the field as well. Again, very, very, very close quarters, because this is shot on a very wide-angle lens, 28 millimeter. And here you are also in the changing room after, Tialata with his family tattooed on his forearm. But I think above all, what I'm most interested in is the intimate stories of people's lives around the world. I first started documenting Abbas uh, in 2005 when he was 15. He'd already spent two years going down this mine pit to look for gold. He's never seen uh, an item that's been made from the gold that he collects. His boss plunged to his death a year before. And he was working uh, eight hours a day, seven days a week, with two days off a year. It's a long-term project. Uh, I hope to go back in 2015. In 2010, I was back there. There's Abbas. Uh, he no longer works down the minefield, but at the top. And uh, he's now, unfortunately, it's hard to believe, but married. And I say hard to believe and unfortunately, because the girl on the left, Aisha, is his wife, aged 13. This is a story of young uh, women who want to stay at school. Unfortunately, boys are preferred in so many of the countries I uh, visit. The girls want to remain at school, and they know that if they sell themselves, it's enough to buy the, uh, the notebooks and all that is necessary to remain in secondary education. Uh, here, the Queen Bee is providing the lipstick and uh, the clothes because they don't have enough money to have uh, clothes that might make them attractive to the men that they're selling themselves to. But sadly, in Bridget's case, five years later, she's now HIV positive. Some stories are of transformation. This is Mariatu, another story that I followed for 10 years. In uh, a camp in Sierra Leone, she pleaded with her attackers to kill her rather than to mutilate her. And uh, I had great difficulty tracking her down. The picture was actually published in a magazine Seven years after I took this picture, and I was told by the readership, three people who rang the magazine that she was now living in Canada, which is where I found her 10 years later. She now speaks fantastic English. She's learning to become a social worker so that she can go back and help uh, women and girls who've been abused in Sierra Leone, here cooking a traditional meal for me. In that particular project, 
I followed 11 women from countries in conflict around the world. Unfortunately, Mabi B, who'd lost her mother in uh, childbirth, uh, father disappeared, mother to a five and seven year old. She's probably 10 or 11, one of the only, um, well, in fact, the only girl or woman that I didn't refind in that particular project. I'm still looking for her today. But it's not all about uh, difficult areas. This was a, an assignment shot a couple of months ago, the Kum Mela, the largest gathering that humanity has ever seen, 100 million pilgrims in 55 days. So quite spectacular for making images shot rather a lot in this particular uh, instance, but very, very photogenic. And as I mentioned, it's not all tough. I recently was assigned to do a, a swimwear fashion shoot in Brazil. <laughs> uh, why are you all laughing? It wasn't, uh, wasn't that painful. And so a few shots to end. The Beach in Ipanema, which is in fact my, my favorite song, Desert Island Discs. I had that down as my favorite song. But as you can see here, very different style of life. There we are, very athletic. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me.